Welcome to the Commonwealth Policy Center's Candidate Forum. I'm Richard Nelson, your host. And joining us for the House District 56 race is Republican State Representative Dan Pfister, who is being challenged by Democratic candidate Chantel Bingham. And for the record, Ms. Bingham was invited to this forum, but she declined to participate. So, Representative Pfister, uh, welcome to the forum. I'm glad you could make it. Good morning, Richard. Thank you for having me. So uh, you've served in the state house since 2021, yes, sir. and uh, you're seeking a third term. So you're elected in 2020, 2022, and now you're going up for a third term. Why don't we start with this, Dan? Um, you know, running for office isn't something that most people think about. It's not a the normal, typical right. job. Uh, first question is: Is did you expect Frankfurt and and being in state government? Uh, when you first ran or before you were elected, did you expect it to be as it is and what you've learned in the last three years? No. In fact, it's totally different than what I ever thought was going on. Um, I never I never saw myself as a politician. Um, never had any inclination of ever running for office. And my, my father-in-law grabbed me one afternoon and, and Asked me if I'd ever thought about it, and I thought he was fun, you know, making a joke. I thought it was funny, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he wouldn't let me out of his office till I agreed to tell him that, you know, I'd think about it, and and I gave it some thought, and my wife and I discussed it, and next thing you know, I was running for office in 2016. Um, lost twice, learned a lot along the way. Um, but I think I think the system we have is working well. We've just got to get people to participate in it, and that's where we are today. So your background, Dan, is you were a contractor, farmer, very involved with the sportsman's community as well, which that's something you and I have in common. Right. I love to hunt and fish, and right. my background is in wildlife management, so we might need to talk off air about your involvement with the Kentucky sure. League of Sportsmen. And you right. you did serve in leadership positions there, though. Uh, well, I was on their board of directors. Uh, the Bluegrass Sportsman's League, it's now in Wilmore, originally was in Lexington. Um, I was president of that five terms okay. and on their board for almost 20 years. Um, I love the outdoors, conservation, you know, um, just part of my life. And I've always been, been attracted to that. Me too. I grew up hunting and fishing and there's something rejuvenating about being in the outdoors, right. just uh, being in God's creation and um, enjoying the beauty of it. And of course, when you're hunting and fishing, that adds a another element to it. So maybe we'll need to swap some hunting stories off after this program is done. <laughs> Sounds good. Yes, sir. So, so Dan, I want to go back to when you first ran in 2016, what was it that you, you mentioned that your father-in-law asked you about running? And usually this is how it happens when a uh, good potential candidate, somebody sees something in another potential candidate but what was it that really sparked you and got your attention to want to run the first time? What did it for me? Um, it was one afternoon. It was late December. Mm -hmm. uh, I was watching my granddaughter. She was on the floor playing. And uh, the newspaper on the counter um, was, was the Woodford Sun. It had a story on the front page about the little Tipton boy who got stabbed to death in his home mm -hmm. uh, that oh, week. Man. Yeah, uh, tragic, tragic yeah. event. There was some news on the, on the TV about a shooting in Lexington, mm -hmm. and I looked at her sitting there on the floor playing, and I'm like, if somebody doesn't do something, mm -hmm. she's not going to have a good world to grow up in. Yeah. That's what got me committed to get into this, um, just trying to make make life better for, for our children and grandchildren. I believe it was Edmund Burke who said that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Exactly. And uh, it's important for those uh, good men, if you will, who care about their grandchildren mm -hmm. and the future of the Commonwealth, they do need to step up and to run and, right. to, and to be willing to serve. Now, Dan, you have served on several different committees, and you currently are on several different committees. Right. Licensing, Occupation and Administrative Regulations, Small Business and Information Technology, the Agriculture Committee, of which you're the vice chair, right. and then Tourism and Outdoor Recreation. Do you have a 
favorite committee out of all these? I like all of them for one reason or another. Um, farming, you know, I grew up on a farm. Uh, it, it's been in my blood, so it, it may be my number one committee. Uh, what do you farm? Tell us what, what's your farming background, cattle? Yeah, cattle, cattle tobacco. Uh, I had my, my first tobacco crop when I was 17. I was a junior in high school. I uh, was running it as a tenant for a, a guy down the road from us. Um, and it farmed pretty much constantly ever since. Uh, I'm now more to, well, I've been been raising cattle, but my son's bringing some sheep in on the farm. So we're, we're trying that out right now. But uh, I'm, I'm more hands-off than I've ever been, uh, but I still enjoy enjoy having a hand in it. So, Dan, you are running for a third term in House District 56, which includes part of Franklin County, where we're recording this program right now, right. part of Jessamine County, and then all of Woodford County. Uh, what would you say the top issues of concern are for the constituents in your district? What, what are some of the things you're hearing now? They're all different. Um, education. You know, this um, amendment on the, on the ballot's drawn a lot of attention from both sides. Um, I don't know. That's, that's probably the biggest issue I'm really hearing about right now. There's, there's a lot of, lot of stuff out there with affordable housing and, and that sort of thing. But I think education may be the, the big issue right now. Woodford County is a beautiful county adjacent to Franklin here, and uh, there's a large number of horse farms. It is uh, some very nice farms there. Uh, how important is the horse industry to Woodford County? In a lot of ways, it is Woodford County. Uh, the, the amount of revenue that they draw in, uh, the tourism it draws in, um, you know, when you when you look at a horse farm, you say, well, that's a couple of guys out in the field with, with the horse, uh, but it's got a bigger impact economically than that. Um, they all have, you know, they're buying cars, houses, gasoline, groceries. They're having repairs done on the farm. They're, there's a lot of people employed because of that farm. And it's a big driver in Woodford County. Is that the biggest industry, single industry in Woodford County? I believe it is. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, Dan, as you go door to door, which I'm guessing you are, you're in a contested election. And right. in order to get elected, you've got to get back out in front of the voters and make the case for your reelection exactly. bid. But as you go door to door um, and, and get out into the community, uh, are you hearing about any, is there any, and I kind of asked this before, but I want to try to drill down, any number one concern? I think of what's happening like in Louisville, they have safety issues. There's mm -hmm. violence. You mentioned school choice, right. but if you could drill down into one thing in particular as you're talking to people, or is there not any? I'm not really getting mm -hmm. anything um, consistently. I, ever, everybody's got their issues. Um, was was talking with a gentleman yesterday afternoon about some unemployment issues. Mm -hmm. They're still very big in this state. Um Crime, crime rings rings heavy with a lot of people. Um, but I, I'm going to have to say education, I think, right now, from what I'm hearing, is, is number one. And this is largely because Amendment 2 is on the ballot, and you voted for that bill, right. which essentially, and there's a lot of misinformation about it, but Amendment 2 allows for the possibility of school choice in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And this is because of a state Supreme Court ruling some time ago that said that school choice is not allowed because of our K Kentucky Constitution. And uh, so you were in favor of this? Well, I, I, think the, I think the issue with the Constitution is the funding. Okay. Uh, I think we can have some school choice, but it, it cannot be funded under the current, current Constitution as it reads. And more specifically, uh, they said that education opportunity accounts, they mm -hmm. struck that down. They right. said that uh, you couldn't have individuals or businesses donate to that and get a tax write-off. Correct. That's specifically what it was. They somehow interpreted that as uh, public revenue. Right. <laughs> they, they, they saw that as uh, state revenue, which that was interesting. Uh, interesting. It created right. some controversy, but now we're here with Amendment 2 on the ballot. Mm -hmm. 
is Woodford County going to vote in favor of Amendment 2? It's hotly contested. A lot of money is being spent on both sides. I think it will. I, just from what I'm hearing, you know, you've got you've got your 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 big groups that are pushing one side or the other. But the 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 man on the street, if you will, I think he wants the best for his family, uh, the best education he can get, and and public education is great. It works well for ninety nine percent of the kids, but. Mm -hmm. But those ones that are not getting what they need, we should be able to, to step up and, and help them out. Dan, how do you respond to the public school administrator or teacher who says that uh, this is going to hurt public education, that it's taking money from public schools and giving it to private schools? It, it, I've, I've heard that, uh, not from administrators, but I've, I've heard that line, it does not take a dime out of public education. It just allows us to use, quote, public money mm -hmm. to fund other forms of education. I've heard it put this way, that it allows, we're not sure what kind of specific right. school choice we'd have, whether it's charter schools or whether there'd be education opportunity accounts or even vouchers. Now, there's some that are trying to peg this as a voucher bill. It's not. It just mm -hmm. allows for the possibility where... Uh, parents would have choices to take money there or, or to pursue a charter school or to have an educational opportunity account uh, and then to do what they feel is best for their right. child. Uh, hotly contested, a lot of misinformation. Uh, so we, we will see uh, we will see what happens with uh, with amendment two. Um, Dan, on your website, I'll move on to something here that you say that you are a pro-God, pro-life candidate that believes very strongly in the U.S. Constitution, including the Second Amendment and your right to keep and bear arms. Um, so tell us what it means to be a pro-God legislator, because, of course, you'll hear opponents who bring up the charge, well, don't we have separation of church and state? Right. So what do you mean by being a pro-God candidate or legislator? I don't know if I've got a real good explanation for that. Um but God is is number one in my life, uh, right there with my family. You know, uh, very very important to me, and that's my guiding light. Um, regardless of whether I'm in the legislature or out on a, a creek bank fishing or, or whatever, um, I try to serve God and and do what's right. Um, I don't know how to explain it much past that, sure. but uh, I don't see where, you know, the, the idea of separation of church and state, that was to keep the government from enforcing or creating a religion and putting on the people. Right. Um, right. I don't think following the word of God and, and following what's in your heart mm -hmm. is doing that to the people. You know, it's it's totally separate. So. Yeah. The, and, uh, uh, you know, along the lines of the political um, history of our country, we acknowledge God as the author of rights, exactly. whether it's in state constitutions or the Declaration of Independence, really our original political founding political document mm -hmm. is a declaration. We acknowledge that there's a God who endows us with inalienable rights. Right. And uh, so that is part of our political fabric. Then you, I'm looking at your lapel on your... Yes, uh, on your sport coat here, and you have little baby feet. Tell us about that. These are the the size of a baby's feet at about twelve weeks of mm -hmm. of gestation. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're put out by the Right to Life movement. I sit on the board of directors for Central Kentucky Right to Life. Mm -hmm. Have been been very much involved with them back into the seventies. I value life. I value our children, and I think we need to need to protect them. So you have a pro-life uh, history even before you got into the legislature. Yes. Pro-life voting record. On the other side, uh, at the Democratic National Convention, they made abortion one of their top issues. Right. They said that this is an issue of reproductive rights. That's the term that they use. They say a number of speakers said that the government has no business telling a woman what she should do with her own body. How do you respond to that? 
I really don't know how to respond to that. Um, what the bottom line is for me is that you're taking a human life, mm -hmm. you know. Um, does the government have a right to tell you when you can do that? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't see a difference between a, a, a baby that's, that's just been conceived and, and a person that's 14 or 25 or 50 uh, still a human life, and we need to protect that and give it the the respect that it that it deserves. And most Americans uh, are opposed to abortion when it comes to the third trimester. Mm -hmm. So the babe, when when you can see that the 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 mother is caring, you can see that bump. Of course, the baby's moving. Two thirds of Americans, according to various surveys say that we're against abortion in the third trimester, late-term abortion, and these babies can live outside the womb. Yeah. But when it comes to that first trimester, a majority of Americans think that abortion should be allowed. How do you reconcile? Because you're pro-life from conception is what you from, just from said. From conception all the way through. I, I see a lot of different studies, and I think a lot of it depends on the questions that were asked at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the... The big difference that I'm seeing actually is that the, most Americans don't want to see abortion used as a contraceptive device. Yeah. You know, um, they, they, there are some that want exceptions under certain circumstances, but um, just to have an abortion for your convenience, I don't think most Americans are really behind that. Right. Yeah. And you're, and I've seen similar uh, surveys that indicate that. Right. Dan, uh, you indicate that you're a social conservative, so the right to life is an important issue to you. Where do you stand on the issue of um, gender ideology, uh, the the biological boys on the girls' sports teams? Uh, where, where do you come down on that? There was a bill introduced and passed a couple of years ago in the legislature, right. Senate Bill 83. Right. Where, where did you come down on that? I, I voted to uh, protect our kids. You know, mm -hmm. I think my granddaughter said it right. Granddad let them go get their own team if they wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, the girls, we, we've spent years trying to level the playing field for the young ladies to be able to play whatever their given sport is. Um, there's obviously a difference biologically between males and females. Yeah. Um, we saw that with some swimmers at the Olympics, that, that kind of thing. It's not fair. Yeah. Um, leave the boys in the boys' locker room and the girls in the girls' locker room, you know? There was a bill last legislative session, uh, what was last year, uh, Senate Bill 150. Right. And that uh, kept gender ideology out of the public schools. Right. It prevented teachers from being forced or it helped teachers from being forced to use gender preferred pronouns of students. But it also went further outside of the schools. It said that minors could not pursue puberty blockers or hormone therapy or transition surgeries. How did you come down on that bill? I voted for that bill. Um, I don't know that somebody under the age of 18 is really able to make that life-changing decision for themselves. I don't think they're capable of understanding what what it's about. Um, you know, there, there's some argument of whether the parents should be able to make that decision. I don't think that, that kids should have that sort of what I would think is abusive um, surgeries and, and manipulations and stuff to their body that they may very well regret. Let them wait till they're of an age that they can make a decision like that. Um, base it on their own facts, but I don't think we should be doing that to our kids. Then moving over to fiscal issues, uh, the state legislature, which is dominated by Republicans, both the House and Senate, have made it a priority to reduce uh, or to eliminate the state income tax. Right. And right. you voted for this both times? Both, both times. Uh, in fact, I can't be for sure, but I think House Bill 1 is going to be another reduction in the state income tax. We've hit the triggers. Um, it will be will be voted on at some point in January. Um, I'm excited about it. 
Now, advocates for reduction of the state income tax says that this uh, makes Kentucky a more competitive place with other states like Tennessee. They don't have a state income tax. It's more likely to attract businesses uh, and puts more money into the pockets of taxpayers. Opponents of this say that it hurts the poor, that, uh, that it's not really helping the poor. How do you respond to that? Well, every half percentage point that we lower the, the state income tax puts about a billion dollars back in the, the working person's pocket. Uh, that's part of why we've got an economy that's, that's growing as well as it is here in Kentucky. Um, the poor people, you know, they, they're going to be, there's always somebody at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And if we don't give them a way to climb out of that, then we're sticking them there. And I think by having an economy that's growing and jobs available gives them that leg up to be able to get out of that hole. You know, to be able to take it to the next level. Uh, I think it's the most humane thing you can do for anybody is to give them some opportunity. And I think that's exactly what this is doing. Okay. So what, to carry on this line of thinking, you'd say that if there are business owners who employ people, if they have more money in their pockets, yeah. they can hire more people or provide uh, raises to their employees. Exactly. Is that what you're and to? I, that's exactly what mm -hmm. I'm getting to. And the more money you have in your pocket, the more you can spend at those businesses. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it snowballs and it mm -hmm. creates more jobs and more opportunity for everybody. Kentucky is at a crossroads. We can choose to give in to the radical left, or we can choose to engage the culture in a God-honoring way. I started the Commonwealth Policy Center because I believe that Christians have a responsibility to influence government and society to the glory of God. While the Commonwealth Policy Center's made a significant impact, our work isn't finished. If you'd like to join our movement working for timeless values, then head to our website. To learn more, go to CommonwealthPolicyCenter.org. If you're just joining us, you're tuned into the Commonwealth Policy Senators, Senate Centers. <laughs> I'll get that out. I've been go. stumbling over that. CPC's Candidate Forum. I'm Richard Nelson, your host, here with State Representative Dan Fister of House District 56. And uh, Dan, uh, Kentucky has one of the lowest workforce participation rates in the right. country. Right. We're only above, I think, maybe six other states. Uh, that have lower workforce participation. Do you have a plan to bring more people into the workforce? And we're talking able-bodied people of working age, 18 to 60, I believe, right. roughly. Right. Uh, too many are on the sidelines. They're, they're, they're on the sidelines. Um, I think part of the problem, I don't have a personal plan that I've hammered out, but but we have been working on some issues in the legislature to try to to get people back into the workforce. Um, you know, we, we, we've obviously have to have a social safety net, mm -hmm. but we don't have to have it as something that you can live on permanently. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, give these people a leg up, give them some opportunity, uh, education, whatever they need to get them, get them started and then let them get out in the world and produce for themselves. And I think that's, it's part of human nature to want to do that, um, and, and that's where we're heading. The case has been made. In fact, I've had uh, guests on my program, the Commonwealth Matters, who advocate that work brings dignity. Work is part of our DNA. God made us to work. He put right. Adam and Eve in the garden and right. made them to work. And when people aren't working, it is dehumanizing, if you will. I want to go back to something you said about the safety net as a society that cares about the vulnerable and the least among us. Mm -hmm. There is a safety net there. Right. But I've also heard it said that it has become a snare, keeping people trapped in it because when they want to work and they start bringing more income in, uh, then they start to lose benefits. They might lose their health insurance. They might lose their SNAP benefits with the, when they have children. And that's a real choice that they've got to make and right. keep some people in that place of being dependent. Well, we on the we government. refer to that as the benefit cliff. Okay. You know, you can, you can earn a certain number of dollars and, and get certain amount of benefits, but if you earn a dollar more, you lose 
a lot of those benefits, and that's not fair. So what's going to be done? Or is there a discussion as to getting rid of that cliff to allow those who are in social safety net programs mm-hmm. to accumulate wealth, to keep their health insurance, to maybe accumulate some savings so that they can transition safely and have some cushion there? Right. So what's, what's, is there anything that can be done? Well, there, there's a lot that can be done. I, the, the idea I like is that uh, you're on there for a certain period of time. That way you know when it's going to run out. You know what you can do in, in the meantime. Uh, you can utilize that time to, to get the education, get the whatever benefits that you need to get you back on your feet. And, and if for some reason you don't make it at a certain period, maybe we need to, need to look at it again. But, but it gives you a way out. Um, you know, say, for example, you're getting help, help with your, uh, your rent. Mm-hmm. Well, as soon as you can't get that help and you can't make that rent, you're back to where you started. So let's give them a chance to get, get their feet under them, uh, get things going and uh, get off of it on their own. Because I think I think most people, once they start earning and, and growing and they see that I can do better than this, I can, I can make a lot more money by doing whatever, and it's something they enjoy, uh, they're going to take off and they're going to be very successful. It's better for everyone it's when that happens, right? Exactly. P- people have, bring some joy into their life when they're working somehow and contributing providing for themselves and their family. Right. There is, uh, that brings about dignity, and uh, that's a good thing. It's a great thing. Yes, sir. Dan, we are just about out of time. Uh, do you have, if you're reelected for a third term mm-hmm. to the Kentucky State House, do you have any priority issues that you'd like to work on? Um, there's a few that I'm looking at that I really don't want to talk about at this point, but I, I've got some things that are still on the table. Uh, one in particular is a moment of silence. Um, I've had that bill before the House twice, and it's passed both times. Uh, it gets hung up over in the Senate. I want to get that uh, across the finish line sometimes pretty soon. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing that this coming session. Um, I guess that's really the, the big one for me right now. Okay. Dan Fister, uh, state representative, Republican from House District 56. You've got the last minute. Tell voters why they should vote for you on Tuesday, November the 5th. That's the election day. That's a tough question. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think I've got your best interest at heart. I want to represent you. One of the problems I've had with uh, elected officials, especially representatives in the past, is nobody knows who they are. You don't see them except for during election time or, or campaign time. Yeah. And uh, I try to be there year-round, uh, always available. I don't care if you're a registered voter or not. If you need help, get in touch with me and we'll, we'll get you some help. So um, please help me to, to get reelected so that I can help you. All right. Very good. Dan Fister, thank you for joining us on CPC's Candidate Forum. Thank all of you for tuning in, and don't forget to vote on Tuesday, November the 5th.